You're listening to another premier old-time radio program and also a proud member of the Blueberry Community. Another Humphrey Tomardella production. Maigre, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. With Maurice Denham as Jules Maigre and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon. What will you have to eat? Oh. Why so gloomy? Well, I'm supposed to be on a diet, George, and I'm very hungry. Order as you please. You are my guest. Mm. The lamb here is very good. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, I better have a plain tornado and salade de tomate. No dressing. No pommes frites. No. Are you trying to get me divorced? <laughs> Being a friend, I'll have the same. Hmm. It's not only your diet that is making you so gloomy, is it, George? You've been quiet ever since we left the toy shop. No, take no notice. I was only... Ruminating? Well, I suppose so. Why should buying a Christmas present for a child... And thank you for your advice. I think the train set an admirable idea. Mm. But why should a toy shop cause such depression? Oh, yes, of course. You once had a case. Yes, that in a way began with a toy shop, a train set. One of your more difficult cases, Rue. Well, certainly one of my more complex, George. One that caused me... Well, it was a disturbing case. May Gray has scruples. Translated by Robert Egglesfield and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce. I can't blame myself for what happened yet. It's difficult not to. <laughs> Do you remember how cold it was that winter? Mm. Yeah, the damn central heating in my office started to play up. But did I say it was cold? It was like a furnace in my office. I couldn't turn the wretched thing down, nor could you, Clark. I can't shift it, Chief. Oh, I hate central heating. Makes the atmosphere heavy. Why couldn't they leave me my old stove? I could work there. I think they took it away because it was installed before you were born. Oh, I'm still functioning. Although I may keel over in this heat. Well, we could open a window. But then I'll catch my death of cold. Which is it to be, then? Uh, well, I shall continue to work without further complaint. Good. Because there's a man waiting to see you. Hmm? Purpose of call, personal and urgent. Oh. Will you see me ask for you specifically? Well, why not? We're certainly slack at the moment. A lot of influenza about. Seems even criminals take to their beds when they get a little cough. I'll oh, show him in, then. What's his name? Uh, Monsieur Xavier Martin. I must apologise for troubling you, Chief Inspector. Uh, please sit down. Uh, you must have lots of calls, like uh, people with their little troubles, convinced that they're, they're interesting. And, and uh, well, I, I, I hesitated a long time before bothering a man as busy as you. Let, let me assure you of that. Uh, um, well, now, I've repeated to myself many times uh, what, what I was going to say, but n now it's all getting muddled up. Well, if you would sit down uh, and, and try to... to stand, look, thanks. try to be a little calmer. I might be able uh, to just follow Just because you. I've been to Dr. Steiner. Well, that doesn't mean... But just a visit for less than an hour, that couldn't mean that, that, that I am mad. Look, I'm sorry, monsieur, but you must explain. Perhaps I'm a little dull-witted today, the heat in this office. Uh, Dr. Steiner. Yes, I know him, one of our best psychiatrists. He's very thorough. I assure you, he found nothing wrong with me. Now, I want to make that quite clear. I'm perfectly sane. But my wife... Well, um, may I smoke? Yes, of course. No, not for me, thank you. Uh, 
Yes, of course. You you smoke a pipe. Uh, I know quite a lot about you. Uh, oh, oh I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, I ought to control myself better, but... Oh, well... Uh, allow me. Thank you. Splendid lighter. Yeah, present from one of my inspectors. Well, please go on. Uh, I've forgotten what I was saying. It would be better if you asked me some questions. Oh, hmm? No, <laughs> you can't do that, of course, because you, you don't know what it's all about. Look, no, I'm listening. Uh, I work at the uh, Grand Magasin de Lune in the uh, toy department. Trains. You're quite famous, Inspector. In my own way, I'm quite famous too. Mm. I'm considered the greatest expert in toy trains in the whole of Paris. Why, we have an exact reconstruction of the Salazar stations, which I built myself. And don't, don't imagine that our customers are just children. <laughs> uh, if you saw... Am I, am I boring you? No, I said I was listening. In any case, it wasn't about electric trains that I came to see you. <laughs> no, my, um, my wife. I live at 17 Avenue du Chatillon. I've lived there ever since I was married. That's why I went to see Dr. Steiner. Uh, because of my wife. Well... Well, I don't want to make any wild accusations, but... Um, yes? I think she has been meaning to kill me. Oh, I see. Mind you, I haven't any positive proof. Just a kind of... Uh, a moral proof. Trifles which are unimportant in themselves, but which, taken together, end up meaning something. Mm. Yeah, well, now, now, I'm not very well educated, but I've been to various libraries to read books on the mental disorders, on neurosis and psychosis, things like that. I couldn't understand them properly, but... But they've made me think. Uh, you're not being very coherent, Monsieur Martin. But if I understand you correctly, you suspect that your wife is not in a normal condition. Uh, something like that. But this is more tangible. I think you'll find it to be zinc phosphate. I've had it analysed by a friend. Could you have it checked? Uh, I, I've looked it up. I've read quite a lot about poisons, how to use them, things like that. I think you'll find that it is very lethal if given in large doses. Once it was used for medical purposes, but proved too dangerous. Where did you find it? In the house. In a cupboard behind the detergents. Not just a few grams, a whole bottle full. But as, as I said, a few grams wouldn't kill you, although you could get very bad stomach pains. And that's what I've been getting for the last few months. Hmm... Which means that if this is zinc phosphate, you think your wife has been using it to try and poison you. Ah, just then the phone rang. It was the chief of police demanding my immediate presence to discuss the details of another case. I asked Martin to wait, expecting only to be away for a few minutes, but it took me longer than expected. No doubt your superior was a very talkative man. <laughs> Correct. When I got back to my office, my nucky pigeon had vanished. Walked out without a word to anybody. Wasn't he free to go? No charge had been laid. Uh, perfectly free, but I was worried about what he'd told me. If his wife was trying to kill him... Well, in the end, I decided he was probably a crank. We get a lot of them in the course of a year. Well, I wasn't at my best in that steaming office that morning, so I shoved on my hat and went home for lunch. Hmm, boiled fish again. And a nice salad. Uh, salad. That's the third day running. Oh, well, I... I thought... uh, Louise, are you on a diet? Oh, I'm bursting out of my dresses. I should lose a little weight. Well, I'm not on a diet. Well, you should be. Louise, is there any reason for this? Mm, losing a little weight is always a good thing. And yesterday I noticed you paused for breath coming up the stairs. I thought you were out of breath. That's why I stopped. Mm. Oh, we should have a maid save you doing the heavy work. You think I'm growing old? No, I didn't say it that. It sounded like it. Hmm. What could that be at this time of day? Oh, girl. Come in, Raoul. Sure. Well, what are you doing here? I, uh, I said I'd drop in on Louise if I was passing. And uh, you were passing at this time of day? Oh, why not? Oh, if I've disturbed your lunch, please carry on. Uh, what's happened? In what way? Oh, come on, pardon. You're not only a close friend, Louise, and myself. You're also our doctor. I certainly don't suspect you of having an affair with my wife. Yet you arrive at this extraordinary hour and... Louise... The diet. 
She's ill. Uh, there's nothing to worry about, Jules. She didn't want you to know, that's all. But uh, she's been a bit off colour. I didn't realise you'd be here for lunch. I should have come later. Look, she's been to see you and didn't tell me. Is it serious? I just told you. She's a bit overweight. And her circulation isn't all it should be. We're all getting older. Minor repairs are necessary. And that's why she looks so flushed sometimes. Uh, yes, sir. I've given her some pills. Look, I've disturbed you. Why don't you finish your meal? No, no, I think I shall have a glass of wine instead. Will you, will you join me? I better not. I have a couple of patients to visit later. Ah. But you are free at the moment? Why? Well, I'd like you to spare me half an hour. A sort of consultation, if you like. Yeah. Uh, something that came up this morning in the office. I tried not to let it worry me, but it has. It's not exactly in your field, but you might be able to help me unofficially. Megri, you realise what you're asking me? An opinion about a man whom I've never seen, whom you don't really know. You're not going by the book. Well, to hell with the book. There isn't a book for this case. No complaint has been made, no crime has been committed, but something is wrong. I feel it in my bones. Now, what I really want to know is why this man, Martin, came to see me. And secondly, why he disappeared without finishing his story. He suggested that his wife is going mad. Oh, not in so many words. Uh, why? Well, that could be an indication that he wasn't exactly stable. A sense of persecution, an unfounded one. I, I don't know. I'm a family doctor, not a psychiatrist. The barrier between a man of sound mind and a psychopath is a fragile one. Mm. The psychiatrist he went to, Steiner, he might help us? Steiner's a tricky customer. Oh, yes, I know. I've watched him as witness in the size court. All right, Jules. <laughs> I'll phone him. Mm. Better I than you. As a doctor, I might get something out of him. I'll let you know later if I have any luck. Oh, I'm going past the Quai des Orfèvres. Do you want a lift? I'll just tell Louise I expect to be in for... <laughs> dinner <laughs> the usual time. Uh, Jean Vier, Chief, uh, did you see that man who came to see me this morning, Martin? Yes. Did he see you? I don't think so. Good. Now, I want you to go to the magazine du Louvre, go to the toy department. Martin seems to be top dog there. His speciality is trains. Find out all you can about him. Oh, and try not to look like a policeman. Why not? Because we are investigating a non-existent crime. And because I don't want his superiors to know that Martin is being investigated. Why not? Because I don't want to run the risk of doing him any unnecessary harm. What do you want me to ask him? Uh, oh, hanged if I know. Mm. General inquiries? Mm, yes. The lights are all right, Chief. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, jean -Vier. Beautiful present. Now, next, I want you to go to 17 Avenue de Châtillon, where Martin lives. Question the concierge and the neighbours. Uh, uh, once again, be discreet. You might do a bit of door-to-door -door salesmanship with a, a vacuum cleaner or something. Chief, without being rude, door-to-door -door vacuum salesmen no longer exist. I know they did years ago, but... No, if anybody else... Sorry, Chief, I'm on my way. Huh. There's a personal call for you in your office, Chief. No, thank you. Why is it so cold in here? Yeah. Uh, hey, Gray. Jules, it's Raoul Pardon. Ah. I phoned Steiner. Yeah. No luck, except a carefully guarded statement that he considered Martin sane. Uh. Professional oath prevented him saying any more. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I found a book that might be useful. Would you like me to drop it off at the Cadiz office? Well, I'd be grateful, Raoul. Uh, and when I've finished dieting, <laughs> come to dinner. I, I should love to. Uh. Chief. Yes, Luca. There's someone outside. You'll want to see him. Oh, will I? Who is it? <laughs> Why is it so cold in here? Well, I had the maintenance men over here while you were at lunch. They turned the radiator down. Well, then turn it up again. Who will I want to see? Madame Martin. A personal matter, she said. Hmm? Madame Martin. Well, what's she like? Elegant, expensively dressed. Different to her husband. Oh, show her in, you can. Right, Chief. Madame. Thank you. 
Chief Inspector Maigret. Ah, uh, that is correct. Uh, come in, Madame Martin. Uh, thank you, Lupin. Right, sir. Uh, will you sit down, Madame? Oh. I expect you know why I am here. Mm, should I, Madame? I, too, have been to Dr. Steiner. No doubt my husband told you that when he came to see you this morning. Well, you must excuse me, madame. I followed him here. I saw him come into the building. Did it surprise you, seeing him here? You know what he came to see me about? I can easily guess. His mental condition, his despondency, his fear of my trying to kill him, his fear that he's going mad. If only he knew it. Xavier has no need of an interview with a policeman. He needs treatment from a psychiatrist. I've told him that. You suggested to him that he might be uh, neurotic. Of course. When you consider his behaviour, what else could I do? He's always been a little odd, but lately... First, he came home complaining about his superiors in the store. Next, about a new salesman whom he accused of trying to worm secrets out of him. About toy trains, of all things. Don't you find that ridiculous? You think I'm being uncharitable. People don't make fun of me because I design and sell brassiers and corsets. Yet that is my work, and I do it successfully. There will always be a market with the middle-aged and the very... Yes, madame, I'm, I'm sure you're right. But to get back to Xavier's behaviour. For example, one evening he told me you'd make a beautiful widow, wouldn't you? Then he went on to say that without him I should have a brilliant career that he was an obstacle to my success. That's when I suggested he should see a psychiatrist. I thought I was being helpful. Do you know his reply? He said I was trying to persuade him he was mad. Can you believe that? Another oddity of behaviour. At meals, he waits until I've swallowed my first mouthful of food before he will taste his own. Is that the action of a rational human being? Madame Martin, when your husband went to Dr. Steiner, did he tell you the result of his consultation? He told me nothing. I went to see Dr. Steiner myself. But he refused to comment about Xavier. What more could I do? Yes. After my visit, I found Xavier even more difficult, more secretive than ever. Then yesterday, he suddenly said to me, Whatever you do, no matter how cunning you are, there will be somebody who will know about it. I was afraid. That's why I followed him here this morning. Well, I've tried to give you some idea of the situation. Now I'm ready for any questions you may care to ask me. Exactly why did you come to tell me all this, Madame Martin? Do you want your husband certified? I don't remember saying anything which would entitle... Look, you've just admitted you are afraid of your husband. I'm afraid for him, not of him. Because whatever happens, I am capable of defending myself. Yes, I'm sure you are. Then what do you want me to do? Do you want me to make a formal application for him to be examined by a mental specialist? Certainly not. I've never suggested such a thing. You work all day, ma'am? Yes. Selling um, foundation garments? And... I work with Monsieur Haris of the Rue Saint-Honoré. I receive a fairly high percentage of the profits from the business, although I have no share in it. Uh, nonetheless, you're in a good position. No better say than your husband's, right? Well, I haven't thought about it. I suppose so. Why? Well, sometimes a man doesn't like a situation like that. Uh, did you always have your present job? No, I was once a sales girl in the Magasin du Louvre. Uh, that's where I met Xavier. But about five years ago, Monsieur Harris was looking for someone to run his lingerie business. I thought it could be interesting. Mm. It is now one of the best three in Paris. Mm. Is your husband jealous of your success? Well, I suppose it's possible. Or perhaps of Monsieur Harris? I find that an unnecessary question. Maurice and I have a very happy relationship. Mm. There seems to be nothing else I can tell you. Perhaps I've been rather foolish. I came here, I suppose, with the vague idea of confiding in you, of expecting some help. As you don't believe me, as you think I'm imagining things unnecessary. Now, madame, do you use zinc phosphate? Yes. Oh, good heavens. Xavier's found it. I use it to get rid of the rats, both at the Rue Saint-Honoré and at home. It's very effective. Is he suggesting I'm trying to poison him with it? Uh, something like that. 
Then I must explain it to him tonight. I told you, Chief Inspector, he needs treatment. Only her hands betrayed her nervousness. It was curious in view of her outward calm, but somehow it made me uneasy. I'd had two extraordinary interviews that day that added up to nothing. Innuendos, no facts, nothing tangible that I could get hold of except a little bag of powder which the laboratory had correctly analyzed as being zinc phosphate. Used to kill rats. Exactly. That evening, I took home the book on psychiatry that Raoul Pardon had delivered to the Quai des Affaires. Hardly part of your job. No, but I needed all the help I could get to try and understand these two extraordinary people. To understand their real reason for coming to see me. I looked for phrases, for attitudes, anything which might explain them. Ah, neuroses. In Adler's opinion, the starting point of neuroses is an alarming feeling of inferiority and insecurity. A defensive reaction. Mental syndrome, a feeling of incapacity is dominant. Oh, that sounds possible, Martin. Neither do they consider themselves blameworthy or at fault. Their pride is characteristic. Arrogance. They bring it into the home. Does that apply to Martin and his wife? Could apply to both of them. Could describe half the population of Paris. What, dear? Mm, oh, just thinking aloud. <laughs> Do you find me arrogant, dominating? Never arrogant, dear. Sometimes a little firm. Mm. You give the impression of being very sure of yourself. Oh, do I? But I know it isn't true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a cold. Mm. Mm, well, the patient considers himself to be the victim of an injustice. Mm. Madame or Monsieur Martin. Or both. So many symptoms which could apply to them both. Ah, too much study confuses the issue. Pardon is right. The difference between insanity and normality is a fragile one. A difficult case. Look, I don't even know if I have a case. Now, you will join me in a prunelle, and then we shall go to bed. I must look after my cold. Good no. <laughs> uh, morning, Chief. I thought you'd overslept. Good morning, sir. <laughs> How's your cold? I haven't got a cold. Well, Janvier, uh, not a lot to report. Look, have you got a match? But you're lighter, Chief. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, mm. Mm. Uh, go on, Janvier. Well... To start with, I obviously look more like a policeman than I thought. Oh. Martin recognised me at once. Mm. I went up to the toy department of the Magasin de Louvre, and I'd only asked him a few questions about the trains. A marvellous display he's laid out. Yes, yes, yes. And when he said, tell Chief Inspector Megre that it's a pretty shabby trick sending you here, he could get me the sack. Oh. So I left. I did better at the Avenue de Châtillon, though. Oh, good. The Martins don't live in the apartment house proper. They have a small cottage at the end of the courtyard. The ground floor is almost entirely a kind of studio come living room. How did you find that out? I used the insurance gimmick. I knocked at the door. A young woman answered. Madame Martin, I asked. Uh, no, she said. My sister won't be back until about seven. Uh, Giselle Martin has a sister. Hmm? Hmm. What's she like? She isn't a beauty, but there is something very feminine about her. It's difficult to describe, but... <laughs> a kind of woman you'd like to protect. Uh, she wasn't interested in insurance, thank heaven, and she told me that both her sister and brother-in-law were already heavily insured. She lives with them? Yes. That's about all. Right. Uh, Le Point. Chief. Uh, listen, my lad, I want you to go to the magazine you do for lunchtime and follow Martin when he comes out. You'll yep. get the details from Jean Vier. Right. <laughs> then I want you to go to a lingerie shop in the Rue Saint-Honoré, name of Harris. Who, me? Well, I, I couldn't go into a place like that. Oh, why not? You might have just become engaged. Why are you blushing? Well, I, 
Uh, it's just possible, Chief, that I... Good. <laughs> Congratulations, Lapointe. So, you could be wanting to buy a nightdress for your proposed fiancée. Me, sir? Go on, she'd love one. Now, jean well, Lapointe, you don't have to buy one. I just want you to find out all you can about the place. Did what you told me, Chief. Mm. I had no trouble in picking Martin out. He never knew who was being followed. Well, I should hope not. Oh. Well, he didn't lunch anywhere near the shop. Instead, he walked to a little cafe about half a kilometre away. That's where he met her. His wife? Oh, no, Chief. Hmm? Well, who then? I think it was the sister. The one Janvier described this morning. Well, the age and appearance, Tally. They didn't kiss, but I think they're lovers. They look so sad. Oh, ever the romantic Lapointe. Well, I was just trying to give you an impression. Of... Yeah, I understand. You think they're in love? Oh, I'm certain of it. I'm sure they aren't unhappy because... Oh, you can't be really unhappy when... You... Lapointe, a moment ago you said they looked sad. Well, yes. Sad in a way. Like lovers who aren't free to show their love. Uh, one day, Lapointe, you're going to learn that we can only investigate, charge and prosecute on substance and fact. Never on impression, on supposition, on conjecture, which may be false. But, Chief, you've got to go through supposition and conjecture until you uncover a fact. You taught me that. Oh. Do I? Well, get on with it. But this time, let me draw my own conclusions, hmm? Well, after lunch, they separated... I didn't follow either of them, but went to the Rue Saint-Honoré. I, I confess I was scared of going into the shop, but eventually I went in and asked for a nightdress. Hmm? The woman who served me, or should I say attempted to serve me, was Madame Marton. She offered me a beautiful one, a model created for Princess Hélène of Greece. Yes. Do you know how much it was? Hmm? Four thousand francs. So I asked for something in nylon. But... You what? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be oh, that, that, That's quite all right, sir. Mm. Her reaction was somewhat similar to yours. Yeah, yes, We quite. don't stock nylon here, she said. Only pure silk and batiste. <laughs> so I thought it was time to leave. Just as I was going, a well-dressed man came in and went straight into the office at the back of the shop. Madame Martin followed him. As I went out, I heard them laughing and... Look back. Madame Marteau reached up and smoothed his hair and then kissed him on the cheek. Mm. They were completely at ease with each other. I... I won't swear that they are lovers, but, look, I said I'd draw my own conclusions. So, Marton doesn't lunch with his wife, who works within a few hundred metres of him, but with his sister-in-law, and his wife... Uh... Maigre. Uh, Xavier Martin, Chief Inspector. Ah. Uh, I, I must apologise about yesterday, but I had to get back to the store. Ah. I, I wonder if I could see you again today. Mm. I, I can get to you before six. Yes, I'll be waiting for you. I hope you understand about yesterday, uh, Chief Inspector. Mm. Discipline at the store is very strict, and in my position... Quite. It, uh... My uh, wife has been to see you, hasn't she? What makes you say that? Uh, nothing tangible. Her manner. Has she been here? Uh, yesterday you came to see me and told me that you were afraid for your life. I suppose you're here today to give me further details, or do you wish to lodge a complaint against your wife? No. It wouldn't do any good. Well, why have you come, then? So that you will know that if anything happens to me, that I haven't killed myself, and that I haven't died of natural causes. Huh? No, No, I'm not mad. I told you about Dr. Steiner, but I'm still convinced that my wife will try and kill me. It was zinc phosphate, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, so, you see, I do know a lot about poisons, how they can go undetected, but I don't intend to go quietly. Well, what exactly does that mean? Uh, I'm taking precautions. I'm not going to rely on the law, and if I have enough time... Monsieur, I'm confused. Am I mistaken in thinking that you intend to kill your wife, in advance, so to speak? Only if she has succeeded in poisoning me. I shall know. I shall be capable of action. Death by poisoning is really instantaneous. If I feel a pain in my stomach, 
Oh, uh, don't worry, Chief Inspector. I'll be able to tell the difference between poison symptoms and indigestion. And uh, I have a revolver at home. So, if you think uh, you've been... No, not think. Feel. Feel that I've been poisoned, then I shan't hesitate. I'll shoot her. Well, you made a very serious admission, Monsieur Martin. Not sure that I shouldn't send you to the special infirmary for examination. Is that really necessary? You can check with Dr. Steiner. Uh, well... Oh, I see. You have already? Ah, uh, up to a point. Mm. Would you submit willingly to an examination by another doctor? Uh, of course. When? I, I have to get time off from the shop. Uh, well, tomorrow, about 11, would that be too early? That would be fine. Huh. You are a curious fellow, Monsieur Martin. Do you... Uh, Love your wife? I did, once. Well, how does your sister-in-law fit into all this? Oh, 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 oh you have been making inquiries. Uh, she came to live with us about two years ago. That's when I began to realise what Giselle was really like, when my eyes were opened. Uh, how do you mean? Her dislike for her sister. I found it uh, unnatural. Uh, and Jenny's so different, so, so gentle. Well, oh, sisters don't always like each other. Oh, it's much stronger than dislike. She puts up with Jenny because she's useful. Jenny keeps house for us as a way of contributing to the rent. It's convenient for Giselle. She can pursue her business career and her affair with her employer without interference. Hmm? Oh, you think she and Monsieur Harris are lovers? I know they are. Then why hasn't she asked you for a divorce? Monsieur Harris is married to a very wealthy woman. Uh, well, what about you? What would you like? You said your eyes were open when your sister-in-law came to live with you. In what way? Oh, uh, well, when I realised that there were other sorts of them. Um... You love her? Yes. She's your mistress? No. Does she love you? I think she's beginning to. Hmm. Oh, is there anything else you want to tell me? There's an insurance policy. A joint one. It's been arranged so that the surviving partner benefits. Then you have as much financial interest in your wife's death as she would have in yours. That's why I mentioned it. It would enable her to buy an equal share in the Saint Honore shop. Well, if there's nothing else, Chief Inspector. Well, I hated to let him go. If anything was going to happen... No, I had to do something about it. Lapointe and Luca were the unlucky ones. I arranged they should spend the night observing the house in the Avenue de Châtillon. Luca agreed to take over from La Pointe around midnight. What did you do? Oh, I went home to bed, of course. I had to look after my cold. I thought you said you didn't have one. <laughs> no, I had to keep up the morale of the office, didn't I? <laughs> well, I went to bed early, just as well. The phone rang at 6.30. Shoo? Hmm. Uh, La Pointe, Luca. Chief Inspector Migret. Yeah. Oh, this is the emergency service, Inspector Schroff. Oh, uh, what is it? We had a phone call from a woman a few moments ago. A woman? Huh. She asked me to get in touch with you and to tell you to go to the Avenue de Châtillon straight away. Huh? Said you know all about it. Uh, did she give her name? No. Well, thanks. Which woman? Giselle Martin, my sister. I, I've done what I could to prevent it. Seems I haven't done enough. I'll get you some coffee. It took me about 20 minutes to get to the Avenue de Châtillon. I didn't find what I expected. Luca had called the criminal records office and Dr. Paul was examining the body. Of Xavier Martin. Oh, yes. It had to be. If the sister-in-law had phoned, there would have been two bodies. Giselle Martin shot, and Xavier Martin poisoned, as he had predicted might happen. Mm. So it had to be Giselle who phoned, and the victim, Martin. Oh, well, that's logical enough, I suppose. I confess I hadn't reasoned it out. I was upset that a crime which I had anticipated had happened, and I'd been unable to prevent it. Xavier Martin had been poisoned. Yeah. He was lying on the floor of the studio-come-living room. 
One got the impression that he'd collapsed while crawling on all fours. His right hand was stretched out as if he'd tried to reach a revolver, which was also lying on the floor, about eight inches away from the fingers. I couldn't understand why Lucas hadn't contacted me instead of Giselle Martin phoning the emergency service. Later, he told me that she'd phoned before he discovered anything was wrong. He'd been watching the cottage from the road quite a distance away. It was only when most of the lights were turned on that he knocked at the door to find out if anything had happened. Oh, my crime prevention methods have proved to be very futile. There was nothing more you could have done. Well, I might have detained Martin at the Cadiz Orfair of the previous night. But he was so willing to be examined. Hadn't any real reason for that kind of action. Anyway, after making a pretty thorough investigation of the cottage, I took the two women to headquarters. Uh, I ordered coffee and croissant and went to the cloakroom to shave. To shave? Yes. And I took my time. I wanted to give the women time to think, time to decide on their attitude and the statements they would make. And I decided to question Giselle Martin first. You think I poisoned my husband, don't you? I don't think anything. Just tell me what happened. As I heard the doctor say he believed Xavier was poisoned, you'll want to know what we ate last night. Uh, who prepared the meal? My sister, as usual. Do you hate her? Is that what Xavier told you? Something like that. Hmm. He was quite wrong. I'm merely indifferent. She's a very spoiled young woman. Mm. What did you eat? Soup, ham and salad, cheese and pears. Coffee? Yes. Jenny prepared that also. She brought it from the kitchen on a tray. You don't help in the kitchen? Seldom. And no, it wasn't I who put poison in the cups. Uh, you think there was poison in the coffee? Hmm? And why do you say cups? Only your husband died, yet you all drank your coffee, I presume? Yes. You'll find out I'm right when you get a report from your experts. So I'm going to save you time. Last night... All I did was to take a precaution I've been taking for some months. When Jenny brought in the tray with the coffee, I switched the cups around so that the cup that was meant for me became my husband's. That's the one he drank. Hmm. And what conclusion does that bring you to? Xavier went into the kitchen for a moment. He could have put poison in my cup if he wanted to. But that doesn't explain the poison in the other cup. What? You see, I was poisoned, too. You? I've surprised you, Chief Inspector. I woke up in the middle of the night with burning stomach pains. I forced myself to be sick in the bathroom. Oh, didn't you call your sister, your husband? <laughs> when one of them had tried to murder me. No, oh, what about the police? I thought of that, and perhaps I would have, but I was going back to my bedroom when I heard Xavier cry out from downstairs. I started down, and I watched him die. He was lying on the floor as you found him, but he was still alive then. When he heard me coming, he tried to reach the pistol. I realized then that he'd been coming towards the stairs when he fell, weakened by the poison, and the gun had slipped from his hands. Yes, he said he'd try and... Yes? <clears throat> it doesn't matter. He raised his head and tried to speak. I've never seen a face so full of hatred. You didn't go down to him? Why take that risk? I couldn't be sure that he didn't still have enough strength to use the pistol. Then he had several spasms and went still. So your husband drank from the cup that was meant for you, yet you were still poisoned. Do you know what this means? No. It means that you are accusing your sister of trying to murder both of you. I'm not accusing anyone. Xavier was so unstable, he could have poisoned both cups to commit suicide and kill me at the same time. No, Madame Martin. Your husband's behavior might have appeared somewhat incoherent, but it followed a more or less logical pattern. He would never have committed suicide until he was sure that you were dead. There is another explanation. Oh, there wasn't any point in going on questioning her. I would have liked to charge her, but I had nothing to charge her with. I wanted her out of my office as soon as I could, so I let her go to open her shop. I don't understand. Why should the sister try and kill them both? Well, she never tried to. No, I had her sent to my office. And as I knew more or less what had happened, I didn't beat about the bush. 
You admit that you intended to poison your sister. I, I, I don't know. I don't know anymore. I suppose so. She didn't understand him. She was driving him out of his mind, suggesting continuously that he was unbalanced. She's very cunning. I think she left the poison around knowing that Xavier would do something foolish in the end. Mm. Did he tell you that he was coming for an examination this morning? Yes. That's what frightened him. I tried to reassure him, but it was no use. He was convinced that after he saw your doctor, you wouldn't let him go free again. No, it wouldn't have come to that. It looks as if he needed treatment. But... Anyway, that's what he thought. That she had won. And he only had one evening left. To free himself of your sister? Yes. So he decided to... Oh, go on. I'd made the coffee when he came into the kitchen. I had my back to him. He, he was only there for a few seconds. And you thought he hadn't had the courage to go through with it, so you put the poison in your sister's cup? Yes. I felt sorry for him. But how did Xavier die? Your sister switched the cups. Oh, my God. I killed him. Well, it's a pity he didn't tell you exactly what he intended and then you wouldn't have been so so deeply involved. Xavier didn't intend to get rid of your sister by poisoning her. You didn't put any poison in his cup, did you? No. But Xavier did. During those few seconds he was in the kitchen. He calculated the dose so that he would make himself ill enough to justify the action he was going to take, but not ill enough to die. You see, he intended to shoot her. It was not for nothing that he made a study of poisons. Mm, for me, it was all over. The rest was up to the judges. Oh, I need a pipe. Try some of my tobacco. It's a different blend. Look, all your blends are disgusting, Georges. I'll use my own. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you got a match? What happened to your lighter? Mm -hmm. Oh, my lighter. Oh, I've lost it. No idea where. jean was none too pleased. Offered to buy me another, but I prefer my matches. Yes, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you, mm -hmm. Georges. In Maigre Has Scruples by Georges Simonon, translated by Robert Egglesfield and adapted for radio by Edward Bruce, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simonon. Luca was Brian Haynes, La Pointe, John Rye, and Jean Vier, Sean Barrett. Louise Maigret, Irene Sutcliffe, Xavier Martin, Malcolm Reed, Giselle Martin, Pamela Lane. Jenny, Jill Schilling, and Dr. Pardon, Douglas Blackwell. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman. <laughs>